Well, I think we're off to a very stimulating and solid start, and uh, it's our turn now. It's a bit daunting. Um, we're going to be talking about Warrant for Genocide, uh, which has as a subtitle in our program, Totalitarianism and Political Religion, uh, interesting choice of words, which perhaps we'll come back to. Uh, I want to thank Robert Balduck uh, for inviting me to chair this session, which takes as its starting point Warrant for Genocide, Norman Cohn's fine scholarly inquiry into the origins of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and the murky world in which the myth of a satanic Jewish conspiracy to rule the world festered. Norman aptly captured the significance and portent of the Protocols when he wrote, there exists a subterranean world where pathological fantasies disguised as ideas are churned out by crooks and half-educated fanatics for the benefit of the ignorant and superstitious. There are times when this underworld emerges from the depths and suddenly fascinates, captures, and dominates multitudes of usually sane and responsible peoples who thereupon take leave of sanity and responsibility. And it occasionally happens that this underworld becomes a political power and changes the course of history. As Norman so brilliantly showed, the protocols of the elders of Zion are only the most celebrated and influential in a long series of fabrications and forgeries reaching back almost to the French Revolution. Today, two distinguished panelists will contextualize Norman's warrant for genocide within the larger body of his work, recognizing its place among his most stimulating analyses of apocalyptic politics and highlighting the role of the book in the intellectual work of the Columbus Center, which Norman founded with the generous help of David Astor. John Gray is Emeritus Professor of European Thought at the London School of Economics. He was Professor of Politics at Oxford and has also taught at the University of Essex and is a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, and other universities. Most of you know his books. Uh, among them, False Dawn, The Delusions of Global Capitalism, Straw Dogs, Thoughts on Humans and Other Animals, and Black Mass, Apocalyptic Religion and the Death of Utopia. Daniel Pick, our second panelist, is professor of history, Birkbeck, University of London. Among his books are Faces of Degeneration, A European Disorder, 1848 to 1918, and War Machine, The Rationalization of Slaughter in the Modern Age. His most recent book, which you can buy around the corner, I think, <laughs> published last month, is The Pursuit of the Nazi Mind, Hitler, Hess, and the analysts. We'll have a bit of time, uh, if we all stick to our time, for questions and discussion following these presentations. And then we're absolutely going to break for the lunch that we brought in at 1 o'clock. <coughs> so, gentlemen, let's begin with our first speaker. Who is our first speaker? John. <laughs> Try and be brief. I didn't... Uh, prepare a, a paper, and now I'm glad I didn't because I've learned a great deal from the first session. And I think um, what I say will be more uh, germane to this conversation uh, for that reason. And there are really three thoughts or observations I would like to make about the impact of Norman's work. I read it, read Pursuit of the Millennium, about which I'll talk. Um, a bit um, in the late 1960s and the thought that stayed with me then was the one which appears on page 286 of the third edition of his book uh, um, the very last paragraph of the last chapter actually the old religious idiom has been replaced by a secular one Cohn writes and this tends to obscure what otherwise would be obvious. For it is the simple truth 
that stripped of their original supernatural sanction, revolutionary millenarianism and mystical animism and mystical anarchism are with us still. And that was significant for me in the following way, which was, it led me to think, and um, some of the very illuminating observations by Professor Di Tomasi this morning uh, were extremely um, uh, helpful to me in this respect. It led me to think then that there was such a thing as an apocalyptic worldview that it had many different variations, but that it could be secular as well as religious. Um, and it also led me to, to think, uh, for a, uh, another reason, which I'll mention in a moment, that apocalyptic worldviews might um, influence political life, not only in totalitarian regimes, and despite the criticism of the category of totalitarianism that we're all familiar with, I still think it described something that actually existed, and was real, although it had various um, different varieties, that apocalyptic wor uh, the worldviews can influence politics in non-totalitarian regimes, including liberal democracies. And I was partly supported by this view by a couple of books which appeared in the 1960s, where Norman is extensively referenced, um, which were critiques of um, American foreign policy, not from uh, the radical left, by people who were in some sense liberals or conservative liberals, uh, one of them, some of you might remember, uh, called The Politics of Hysteria by Edmund Stillman and William Pfaff, where Norman, Norman's work on um, the medieval period is extensively referenced, and where it's argued, which um, uh, Pfaff later developed the argument in a book called American Messianism, it was argued then, remember this is the 60s, that messianic strands of thinking and apocalyptic strands of thinking could be found in uh, several important American traditions and have fed into American, the making of American foreign policy. So that led me to think even then that the importance of that apocalyptic politics as a general category with many different and even contending varieties um, was not only an idea that could be put to work in understanding modern communism and Nazism, but could also actually illuminate aspects of democratic politics. So that's my first uh, thought. Um, the second concerns the issues we've been discussing about psychoanalysis um, and Norman's um, uh, disillusionment with it and his eventual repudiation of it. And I must admit that my own feelings have got quite mixed on this. Um, I'm tend I can't read Norman's book Warren for Genocide without coming away with the uh, con confirmed belief that there is such a thing as um, collective psychopathology and that there are such things as um, deep-seated irrational worldviews. But of course, on the other hand, we all know that um, historical understanding, by enabling us to find what people do and what people believe, um, an intelligible response to their circumstances, in a sense, reinstalled rationality by suggesting that what they believe is not actually it's not actually a symptom of madness, but it is in some sense a, an intelligible human response to the situation in which they find themselves. So there is this sort of tension, if you like, in the way we think about this, these issues, which um, I don't think we can entirely escape. But one respect in which it was mentioned that Norman had drawn on uh, thinking about the psychology of groups um, in his work, but other people who were studying the psychology of groups later drew on Norman, in particular Leon Festinger in his, I still I think, still wonderful book the, um, uh, When Prophecy Fails, which for those of you who may not have uh, read it lately um, concerns um, <coughs> Festinger's uh, attempt to test um, his theory, the theory developed with his colleagues of cognitive dissonance in which um, information and perceptions and new facts which subvert or contradict uh, human beliefs um, tend to be uh, reconstrued as confirming those beliefs. That, that phenomenon of cognitive dissonance was tested by Festinger and his colleagues in a sort of experimental way when they uh, uh, infiltrated a UFO cult 
in America, which was um, confidently predicting uh, the end of the world with a great flood and the arrival of the UFOs on a particular night, and sat and waited for it, and Festinger predicted, a prediction which was fully corroborated, confirmed, that towards dawn, the leader of the cult would say, our administrations have worked, we've been in touch with the, with the flying saucers, they haven't brought the end of the world out, so it confirms our beliefs. So we'll go out and, and defend them all the more vigorously, and that happened. Now, the interesting thing about that, Festinger discusses Norman's work on um, medieval uh, millenarian movements at considerable length in the book. And, but the methodological, or if you like, almost philosophical or epistemological issue this raises is that for Festinger, cognitive dissonance uh, in the context of the UFO cult had assumed a, um, uh, uh, an extreme form. Uh, um, but cognitive dissonance, Festinger believed, was normal. So irrationality, he, he described cognitive dissonance as a form of irrationality because it involves discounting information which is relevant to your beliefs or reinterpreting it so that your beliefs persist even though they've been, in some sense, falsified. That's irrational, he said, but it's normal. And so it's not madness in the sense of um, an outbreak of pathology. It's a normal human trait. Um, and similar things have been studied later in completely different contexts by so-called behavioral financial economists who study the way in which people who make investments have what's then called confirmation bias because they absorb avidly all the information which says that they've made the right investment until it fails. Uh, and then they even perhaps have a, some direct, <laughs> direct cognitive dissonance and say that just shows I was right all along. Um, uh, um, um, but the, the methodological point is this is irrationality, not so much psychopathology, at least not of the kind that... Uh, but I r remain, as it were, doubtful as to whether we can do without the idea of collective psychopathology if we're studying the phenomena like um, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and its uh, long reverberations uh, in, in the 20th century and the 21st. I doubt that we can really do without it. So in a sense, if I have a difference with Norman, it might have been that he was too influenced by the criticisms of psychoanalysis as a, as, a, as a method. I mean, I know it's been widely junked now as being <coughs> radically unscientific, but it might be able nonetheless to help us in historical understanding and experience. Just a final point on um, the relevance of apocalyptic thinking and apocalyptic politics to liberal democracy. Just a couple of very brief uh, observations. Um, The term, the end of history, seemed to me when um, Fukuyama used it uh, in an essay in 1989 and then subsequently in a book to be a clearly apocalyptic provenance. So I delved a little bit into the formative intellectual influences on Fukuyama and found, obviously, as many of you know, that Koyev was one of them. But I also found that one of the formative intellectual influences on Koyev was a Russian religious philosopher called Soloviev who wrote a book called the end, of, the end of Time and Apocalypse. And he belonged, Solovier, late 19th century, early 20th century, to that Eastern tradition of Christian apocalyptic thinking, which was alluded earlier when we were, I think, quite rightly cautioned not to treat it as something which only occurs in Western Christendom. And so that, in turn, led me on to wonder whether... Um, some types of apocalyptic thinking might still be uh, element, uh, evident in American um, foreign policy, and I concluded um, that they were. Final point on the varieties and um, different kinds of apocalyptic uh, worldview um, that can um, uh, uh, be found in um, contemporary and recent um, Politics and in and, and in the interaction between cults and politics. One group I'm not an expert on it by at all, but that I've been interested in is the um, Japanese Aum cult, which attempted to um, use anthrax and other weapons of mass destruction to bring about a catastrophic end of the world, cleanse the world of evil influences, and bring about a radically better state of affairs for the remainder of the human species that would survive. 
Now, the interesting thing for me is that's sort of clearly an apocalyptic worldview. It's a, it's a variant of the point. It has all the marks, all the categories. But of course, it's, it, and it's also a cult, so in a sense, it's religion. Uh, it's, it, it, it's part of the uh, phenomenon of religion. And throughout this, by the way, we have the kind of background question of what constitutes secularity or what. It's one of the most interesting features of Norman's work, which is leads us to ask what secularity means in an idea or, or a pattern of thinking. When is, I mean, especially if, as he holds, central categories of religious thinking reappear in what is commonly described as secular worldviews and secular belief systems, but they're clearly in some other sense secular. Now, the interesting thing about Bauer in this respect is it didn't recruit among the um, displaced and the marginal. It recruited mainly among university graduates and chiefly among biologists and geneticists and people from relatively hard scientific disciplines. So we have, here we have, I mean, earlier on we had some discussion as to whether Norman was to be criticised as to seeing these apocalyptic movements as movements from the bottom and coming up and challenging society. And it was pointed out, well, certain religious structures also used apocalyptic thinking to defend their position and so on. Well, in the, this case of Alm, it's clearly not coming from the... It's not unemployed Japanese workers who are doing this. These were um, a variety of people who who are graduates, who are scientists, and who are somehow, somehow drawn to this sect in a way that I don't understand and I don't think it's been properly explained, but which did happen. Um, and that, I think, t- tells me about the enormous fertility uh, of Norman's um, work. Uh, that's to say, it's fertility in um, uh, um, producing new lines of historical book inquiry which help us to understand the world about us. It's by no means restricted, although I still find it very illuminating, in respect of 20th century totalitarianism and the idea of political religion, which I think is also uh, kind of, it's by no means restricted to that. It still goes on being so, uh, very, very useful for the very reason I started with and the previous speaker mentioned and now I'll stop, uh, which is that I think what he did was... Um, more or less establish, I think, although I know there are people who are not persuaded by this, um, um, the identity of, a, of, a, of, of uh, the apocalyptic worldview, an identity which is not lost um, or compromised in virtue of the fact that it has many different varieties and is used by many different historical actors and agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, and Marina for, in a way, getting this going. Um, Before I start, I wanted to also mention a conference in September at the Welcome, which links with this idea of totalitarianism, called Psychoanalysis in the Age of Totalitarianism. And finally, just to mention also that um, I can give people the reference later, but the reports that that Norman Cohen wrote about the Columbus Centre, I've put it onto a uh, an archive website uh, in the history department here at Birkbeck. So if anyone's interested in, in the actual report Norman Cohen wrote at the end of the Columbus project, they can find it online. Um, it's just called The Pursuit of the Nazi Mind, which is my book title, but it's a teaching resource. Um, you can just Google it if you want to find And it's got some of the papers as well from the Aster archive as well. Um, this can be no more than a sketch of my one meeting with Norman Cohen, and some half-thoughts about my interest in his work and that meeting. Uh, It's not an argument, I think, but perhaps it's some questions, not answers or arguments, but some first impressions and questions built built around what I'll give as a brief description of the Columbus Project, its pros and cons, and the tensions that lay within it. And I've got a couple of clips from an into the interview that I conducted uh, with, with Norman Cohen, and I wanted to thank Phil Tinline, who's here from the BBC, for helping me to to get that into a form that could be used today. And I hope this will generate some discussion. So I had an opportunity to meet him a year before his death at the age of 92, and I'm I'm unlikely to forget the occasion. Our discussion took place in the summer of 2006. I'd sought him out because I'd become increasingly interested in his work, particularly the research that he produced and also fostered under the auspices of the Columbus Centre, which, as William Lamont mentioned earlier, was originally known as the Centre for Research in Collective Psychopathology. Um, Now, this was because it was relevant to my own research on the Anglo-American history of the psi professions uh, 
and the, the wartime and post-war endeavours to try to, tr to track the Nazi, Nazi mentality. And I realised with hindsight that my title, The Pursuit of the Nazi Mind, must have been in some way an unconscious uh, reflection on his title, The Pursuit of the Millennium, although I didn't realise it consciously when I ended up with that title. But most particularly, I was interested in his use of the concept of fantasy and the fact that sometimes he gave it a PH spelling, which was precisely the psychoanalytic spelling of fantasy to differentiate it from the ordinary use. In other words, to stress the unconscious dimension. For psychoanalysis, there was always this unconscious sense of fantasy, particularly in the Kleinian tradition that he clearly uh, knew. Um, uh, and this was a constant feature of the, the normal mind, colouring reality, not just a feature of the eccentric, the daydreamer, or the mad. And the notion that fantasy was mobilised in ideologies and in some sense relevant to their constitution in the first place, uh, I think his work suggested, could enrich the study of history and politics. And I did wonder how far this might be seen as a kind of English version of the American post-war genre of psychohistory. Now, clearly his work was very different to psychohistory in the psychobiographical sense that Eric Erickson gave it in Young Man Luther or that Walter Langer gave it in The Mind of Adolf Hitler. But it is perhaps a kind of psychohistory in the sense of exploring how fantasies, fears and desires may sweep through cultures, people's movements and so on, and how fantasies can shape and then be shaped by collective identities. And there are many questions I have about his role, really, in, uh, particularly in, the, well, in his work on witchcraft and, and its relationship to other later 20th century interventions. People have mentioned thinking with demons, but I think also of Carlo Ginsberg's work on, uh, on witchcraft and Lyndall Roper's later on and their interest in, in psychoanalysis and witchcraft. Um, and there would be more work to do, really, to tease out the relationships between those different bodies of work. But I think the Columbus Center was a most unusual and now largely forgotten multi-authored project that he directed, nominally, as was mentioned earlier, at Sussex, but for much of the time in London. He had an office here in Bloomsbury. And it generated not just books, but a range of meetings, sometimes in smart London and New York hotels, for brainstorming, funded by Asta. At its core again, as mentioned earlier, was the endeavour to study the exterminatory logic of Nazism and to compare this with other catastrophic cultural forces and events that had resulted from absolute convictions of truth and error, right and wrong, of, on the one hand, a certain mad kind, uh, and on the other, of, with, of a certain logical kind, within a certain shared discursive space, so arguably, in that sense, not mad at all. Um, and I think this, in a way, links with, with the discussion earlier and Jinti's paper about, um, about how one sees the rationality and irrationality of group processes. I've actually reproduced, I've got about 20 copies, but I'll pass it round, but Astor's original article that was mentioned in Encounter magazine. So um, it may be one between two of those, but um, this is the original piece in which I think what's one of the things that's striking is the reference to madness. Um, that runs throughout the essay. Um, normal madness, he says. Um, so Cohen, was, Cohen was, was clearly interested in how certain ideas and beliefs could then require draconian forms of action involving persecution of a particular group, real or imagined. So here I wanted to draw um, on my interview with him and to make some observations about my impressions during that meeting to say something about the context, the, the intellectual context of this work, and to flag up the problems of applied psychoanalysis that was encountered in the work, and perhaps the tension between Astor and Cohen as to the appropriate role and limitations for the historian of Freudian thought itself. I, I, was, I thought the project that, 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 that ran was also interesting because of its attempt to place past and present in dialogue, to put history into dialogue with psychology and politics, to promote work in multidisciplinary teams, and to encourage scholars to bring their learning and research to bear upon the most pressing political and social problems of the day. And I think it was apposite that it was linked to Sussex, at least um, institutionally, uh, given the excitement that surrounded this flagship of the new universities of the post-war period. Um, 
It was, in a sense, a unique undertaking, but it did have affinities with other projects of the post-war period on both sides of the Atlantic that sought to draw larger lessons from Nazism, to compare and contrast national experiences, and to get to what one might call the unconscious appeal of fascist ideology. And I think it bears comparison with projects that were run uh, under the auspices of the Frankfurt School um, and also at UNESCO immediately after 1945, uh, in which Henry Dix, who also features as one of the writers later on in Norman Cohen's project, also was a key player. And I detail those earlier projects elsewhere in, in, in this book that I mentioned. I think, unlike the Frankfurt School, one could see it rather as an endeavour to think in terms of liberalism and psychoanalysis rather than Marxism and psychoanalysis. Um, it wasn't, in that sense, uh, quite congruent with Eric Fromm, Marcuse, Adorno and company, but it was an attempt, perhaps, to think about, um, uh, in a way, the political irrational in relation to sort of liberal ideas about the political subject. I was also struck, and this again resonates with the discussion in the first panel, about the relationship between the research Cohen uh, produced on popular movements and the literature of the history from below tradition, the Communist Party historians group, although clearly Cohen didn't share their Marxism, and this came across also in my interview with him. Um, and he marked in the discussion, particularly his distance from Eric Hobsbawm and indeed Christopher Hill, um, who he knew slightly at Oxford. He, he talked, actually, there was a contradiction in what he said about Hill in my discussion. On the one hand, he said he felt Christopher Hill was rather... Um, disdainful of the, the pursuit of the millennium and then later in the conversation he remarked on Hill's great appreciation of the book so anyway there was something that I never quite re uh, resolved with him about that but certainly E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class which came out also in the early 1960s um, uh, I mean different though it obviously was from this body of work nonetheless was perhaps part of this zeitgeist in the sense that fantasy and the unconscious enjoyment of a certain kind of rapture and excitement came to be taken so seriously in Thompson's discussion of Methodism in, in that extraordinary psycho-historical chapter of the making of the English working class, which talks all about sexuality and hysteria, and that I think bears some comparison with Cohen and Columbus. Interestingly, Thompson made no use of Freud, but Eric Fromm was cited in the making of the English working class. And what Thompson surely conveyed was the requirement to search beyond any standard social historical explanation, Marxist or otherwise, in trying to understand the passions surrounding Wesley and the Methodism he had inspired. Now, the name Columbus Center is something of a mystery to me. I did ask David Astor's biographer, and he doesn't know either. Um, uh, but... Um, just to say again that it was prompted by this address by David Astor that I've just passed round, and he became the guiding spirit and principal financier of the project. The wealthy observer editor had a long-standing interest in psychoanalysis and in liberal political causes. He urged that this new enterprise should be created along the lines, he suggested, of Chatham House, um, to understand political psychopathology and especially the destruction of the Jews. For the latter had involved, he declared, quote, a fantastic perversion of all sense of right and wrong. And as remarked, this was to mark the, the, the original talk he gave, was to mark the 20th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. The aim was to link what had happened under Hitler's rule with other forms of persecution and mass killing, prompted by irrational fears and desires, i.e. beyond any utilitarian calculation of gain and to see what deeper knowledge might be required about the, uh, and acquired in studying this about the human condition, and what safeguards might be needed in future to detect such dangers at an earlier stage, and hence to alleviate them. It was not war as such, but rather ethnic murder, collective prejudice, group phobias, paranoid modes of thought and policy that clearly interested Astor. Pondering the Nazi experience, Astor felt that a deeper mystery remained. He paid tribute to the fact-gathering of the historians that had occurred already in the 1950s and the impressive evidence made to gather evidence about the camp system and the scale of the destruction. 
But he wanted to ask in a deeper sense, and I quote him, what are we confronted by? Was it a temporary outbreak of madness? Was it simply the evil latent in human nature? Or again, quote, was it an example, a supremely terrible example, of the pathological possibility of the normal mind? Cohen had come across the article, he made contact with Astor, and from this emerged their rather remarkable, if in many ways un- ultimately unsatisfactory, collaboration. It was clear why Cohen was an attractive director from Astor's point of view, with his background in intelligence, in the war, his fluency in German. Cohen had even been in Germany in 1937 and witnessed the rise of Nazism, his deep knowledge of Western history and thought over millennia, to say nothing of a cautious but open attitude towards the psychodynamic approach that Astor promoted. There was a natural match. Both had first-hand personal experience of psychotherapy and a sense of its potential value. And Cohen's work in Austria as part of the occupying forces, again, as mentioned by William Lamont, had given him access directly to the testimony of various SS officers after the war. Reading Astor's original article and hearing the discussions that ensued, and I've acquired uh, from the Astor family the original tapes of those conversations, and I hope eventually to put those online as well, um, it's, it's, it was a fascinating project. It involved at various points Astor, Cohen, invited contributors such as Henry Dix, the psychoanalyst Pearl King, the anthropologist and later psychoanalyst uh, Elizabeth Bott Spilius, the anthropologist Jack Goody, the sociologists Brian Wilson Ed Schills, the French uh, 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 researcher Leon Polyakov, uh, ATM Tommy Wilson from the Tavistock Clinic, and on occasion, uh, although they were, uh, he was sceptical, the historian Max Beloff, as well as Asa Briggs and, and others in discussing Astor's agenda. Astor wasn't the only funder. Wolfson and others contributed too, but it had his particular stamp. And it's clear that the language of mental illness and health were brought together here with political analysis in this work. The roots of this inquiry, as I've said, can be traced back earlier, not just to the post-war literature I've mentioned, but also perhaps earlier still to work in the 1920s and 30s on the psychopathology of fascism. But more immediately, it can be seen in the context of the Eichmann trial in the early 60s, <clears throat> as well as Arendt, Hannah Arendt's influential commentary and the disturbing experiments on human obedience of Stanley Milgram. An influential new literature on brainwashing was also emerging in the late 1950s, for instance, in the early work of Robert J. Lifton in the US and the work of the uh, English psychiatrist William Sargent, often centred on concern about American prisoners of war who'd been taken captive by the enemy during the Korean War in the 1950s and had been turned. And again, this also, of course, resonated back to the show trials in uh, the Soviet Union in the late 1930s. Cohen, in response to Astor's question as to what would be the the best point of comparison, chose the witch craze of the 16th and 17th century, and it was the fantasies at stake and this idea of a general conspiracy to bring ruination in one case on Christendom, in the other on the imagined Aryan race, that for him marked the point of comparison. A central thesis of Europe's inner demons, which was in a way the culminating achievement of Cohen's Columbus years, was the fantastical nature of the object that was constructed. He wasn't interested in the way some later witchcraft historians were, I think so much in the unconscious dialectic between the victims and the interrogators. For him, it was the way a figment of the collective imagination was concretized into an entirely fantastical reality. So this was the background to my um, interest in talking to him, and finding him had been my first task. Uh, Initially, I drew a blank. Uh, I talked to Uh, I I also asked Sussex Archives Department. They didn't know where he was. There were no documents. Uh, I was stumped. I asked colleagues in early medieval and uh, early in medieval and early modern history. Everyone knew of his work, but he himself had dropped out of sight. Uh, People didn't uh, in the university didn't seem to know about him. This suggested something of the lonely furrow, perhaps view of. Cohen as historian, but this wasn't entirely right, not only because, on the one hand, he wasn't a standard, fit, professional historian in the first place, but also I think the lonely image doesn't quite work. After all, the Columbus Centre was, um, there he was, choreographing this whole elaborate 
team of researcher. Anyway, via a helpful intermediary who's here, the psychotherapist Michael Bryant, who knew him and his wife Marina, I was put in touch with him and went to meet him at the cottage that he was staying in at Wood End in Hertfordshire that belonged to his son, the well-known American-based writer on rock music, Nick Cohen. I was received by a rather spry elderly man. He cut a striking figure, and I was impressed by his alert eyes, mellifluous voice, and full beard. And I think my own imagination immediately ran riot in the presence of the author of The Pursuit and Europe's Inner Demons, so steeped in languages and a form of old-school scholarship, and perhaps something, because also his interest in the Old Testament, made him seem like a sage of yesteryear, and I couldn't help thinking of Ruskin and Tolstoy with that full beard. In fact, he turned out to be quite down-to-earth, able to take the measure of his interviewer, courteous, wry, and a little sceptical. He also took some reassuring after I produced a tape recorder and asked if he minded my recording our conversation. He was worried his his comments would be misused in the press, and I think he'd had some bad experiences when he directed the Columbus Centre, was loath to have anything turned into sound bites, and I think it was one of the areas of tension with the Observer editor about the role of the media in what they apparently collectively called, long before Blair, the project. (laughs) We had lunch in a pub in a neighbouring village, a watering hole that he apparently knew pretty well, and he drove, uh, somewhat to my trepidation, he was 91, but very well, and we spent a number of hours talking about his work. Let me now play, if I can make this thing work, an extract in which I ask him about his war service, including at Bletchley, so we can actually hear his, his voice. Well, then came the war, and... Uh, you were at Bletchley? Uh, well, uh, I ended only the last year of the war, actually. Uh, but at any rate, owing to my German, I was largely in one form or another of intelligence. I started as an infantry officer, but uh, never got, uh, I never got, I got abroad, uh, and uh, uh, I was transferred to intelligence uh, in, I think, 1942, and uh, ended up actually in the last year of the war. Well, anyway, that's, uh, well, th- then, then I, as I said, I, having a wife and child, I had to get a job with the qualifications that I had. Uh, that meant in point of fact going into French, and I ended up as um, professor of French at Newcastle, which was at that time part of the University of Durham. Well, then, by, really by chance, I happened to pick up a copy of Encounter, which had in it an appeal, uh, or rather a, a talk, a lecture, delivered by uh, David Astor uh, to some Jewish organization uh, in commemoration and on the anniversary of uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Rising. Mm. And in this, he said that it would be very desirable that some uh, I think you probably even said institute. I haven't got a copy of the, the, the document now, but uh, it's every that some some institute or or project should be founded for studying those aspects of human nature which made such things as the Holocaust possible. Well, this was pretty general, and I, uh, but I, it's sounded to me interesting, and as I've been teaching French for a long time and, uh, and meanwhile written my book The Pursuit of the Millennium, uh, I thought that uh, this sounded an interesting idea and I met David Astor and he then rather very generously uh, offered to support me if I would try to organize such a research project. So. Uh, I gave up my German French and uh, moved off first of all in private capacity and then after a few years uh, the whole thing was taken over by the University of Sussex and I became first uh, professor of German and then uh, 
professor at the University of Sussex. This was with the support well, of, he, of he, Asa Briggs, particularly, was uh, it? Uh, uh, yes, well, yes, he, he moved in just about mm. uh, during that time. And uh, uh, and uh, well, originally, the man with whom it was originally was Fulton, uh, and who in San Diego, David S. as tutor at Oxford, uh, pre war, right. uh, not that David ever took a degree, but um, <laughs> uh, so he knew Fulton, and so that made that connection up the easy. But in point of fact, it was Asa who. Um, Really, was more deeply involved with Fulton and Richard Brown and David. Uh, at any rate, all that's not terribly really interesting. But then, um, so for some time, I worked alone under David Dance's auspices and produced uh, a book called Water for Genocide mm -hmm. and uh, on the protocols of the of sound and the myth of Jewish world conspiracy. And uh, then uh, the whole thing of finance planted by David Astor, but partly also by uh, Wolfson, uh, was transferred officially to the University of Sussex. And uh, I had a small team of part time researchers who didn't live in Sussex or the English capital or the place. One of them, these Dan Polyakov, one of the best, was in Paris the whole time. But we all used to meet from time to time. And I had a little office in London. I didn't actually live in Sussex. Uh, they, they sponsored the whole thing. But I operated from London, largely because the sources I needed for work were there. And Sussex was quite new and had a little mm -hmm. library in those days. I've just got a few final points and then one last clip if you'll bear with me. Um, so the Columbus Project resulted in a series of books including Henry Dix's licensed mass murder about which I could say more later in discussion, Leon Polyakov's The Aryan Myth, two of Cohen's own aforementioned studies, a work by Anthony Storr which you'll hear him being in the next clip a little disparaging about, as well as some work actually it extended then also into an analysis of race relations in South Africa uh, another of David Astor's particular interests, of course. Astor had high hopes, although perhaps, Norman suggested, and again you'll hear a bit more about that on the next clip, he was disappointed by the results. Astor's wish, he added, was for something on a vaster scale, and he talked about the idea of something which would have involved field work, something that could only have been realised by a much larger operation than, than this. I think the gap between Cohen's and Astor's ambitions for the project can be detected in the final clip I'll play, in which he also marks his distance from the quest for the psychoanalysis of history. In our conversation, he had noted his own unease with how far he had himself pushed the argument for the unconscious dimension in his books, and how he had, for instance, dropped his own foray into psychohistory in a later edition of Warrant for Genocide. He felt that David Astor treated the entire German nation as akin to a patient that needed treatment, whereas he wanted to acknowledge differences and nuances. Not all 60 million Germans were Hitler lovers, he said. And he wanted to focus on what he called, and I think again with echoes of Hannah Arendt and Eichmann, bureaucratic automatism, that was his phrase, as a social mechanism. Uh, quote, just as you write out your income tax forms if you are in the revenue, so you drive the trains to the camps, he said. He felt that Astor had swallowed Freud too enthusiastically, especially Freud's book Group Psychology, which he singled out here in the interview, as, as one of Freud's, in, in Cohen's view, weakest works. Freud, outside the consulting room, he felt, was never at his best. But it felt like a critique not only of Freud, but perhaps also of his own as it were, in earlier enthusiasm, and something that had seemed smack too much of a missionary endeavour to combine psychoanalysis and political analysis in the first place that Astor had invited him to pioneer in setting up the project. But I think whatever he says here, there is in fact a more complex story to tell about the methods and ambitions in the project and in Cohen's own work regarding this interface between psychoanalysis and history. 
But I'll leave him now with the last word, with these comments on David Astor, which is, I think, quite a put-down. Um, also his mention of, the, uh, of Pearl King, the psychoanalyst who's there in the project, but he thinks rather inconsequentially, and Anthony Storr, again with a rather cautionary tone. And I was only sorry that I did not get back for a planned second discussion with him. I was away on sabbatical in France the following year, and I had a message from Norman about our planned second meeting. And on my return from France, one of the first things I did was to phone to arrange the date of that meeting, but sadly by then I discovered that he'd recently died. So I just want to now play this second. He himself repeated it out since this is I was joked. <laughs> Not my own, but my somebody else. For 17 years <laughs> with uh, Anna Floyd. Uh, but he knew very little about analysis. <laughs> he had a, an almost religious faith uh, 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 it could uh, it was the key to all understanding mm. of human nature. A few I never shared. Uh, mm. And uh, he, he was no scholar. Or he, he didn't even know what scholarship was about. But he thought somehow that psychoanalysis would unlock the key. And as I was favorably inclined to taking analysts into this project, we didn't disagree on that, but I think. We never really discussed it. Uh, but Paul King was supposed to put in because he wanted, uh, uh, and he was one of the, one of the two people who financed it. So he had some right to express his views. He wanted, in addition to uh, uh, the uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, Henry Dix, who was, uh, who actually was a book, he wanted a representative of the true Freudian uh, school, which um, Henry Dix ever had been. He had himself, Henry Dix had had a Freudian and a Jungian analysis, but he didn't belong to, mm. to the Freudian. He was at the Tavistock, wasn't he? Yes, he was at the Tavistock. So it, David wanted uh, some of it. And so, did did uh, uh, David Astor know Henry Dix personally then? He, he met him up in, uh, at, at my house. Right. And then he got on quite well. But I think he still had this idea of he must have a true Freudian. So I took advice and we got him for a king, but I can't say that um, she played any, mm. or she never wrote anything at all. Mm. And, uh, Were there other, other psychoanalysts involved? or? Yes, yes, we, we were all trying to block with them. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was the, uh, there was um, a Jungian, uh, Anthony Stoll. Oh yes, he, and he wrote a book, didn't he? Uh, uh, yes, that was mm -hmm. very unfair. He was let down, but it was only supposed to be a third of a book. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really want to publish it. I mean, one thing, the book isn't. Uh, it, we debated quite a lot. But it seemed to catch on. It was translated very saying just but he felt it to be superficial and deprived of the backing it was supposed to have from other people who just didn't produce. Uh, it, 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 it remained rather superficial. And um, so that wasn't a major trouble. Henry Dix's book established itself as authoritative in its way. Um, but uh, David Astor's dream of uh, throwing much light upon the old aspects of human nature, etc., etc., nothing ever came of that. And uh, indeed, that was, uh, I think, here I had some very really different ideas as to what, what, what that could be. Was he ple pleased with what you did produce, do you think? Um, I think it is hard, but he probably wasn't. Uh, he did himself never read it. Mm. He never read books, so he didn't know. Mm. But when I wrote uh, the, uh, the documents that you had, yes. the just description of the whole thing, uh, he was no more than polite and acknowledging receipt, etc., etc. Mm. He didn't say this was the realization mm. by Greek uh, Indeed, he, uh, he couldn't have said that because I think his dream was unrealizable. Mm. Or at least if it were to be done, it would really mean a history 
of which would have to involve sociology uh, and anthropology and history as much as psychoanalysis, really tracing uh, the way that human groups were always that human beings are social animals, and this is, I'm saying now for myself, they are social animals, and uh, they have never had any difficulty in killing members of other groups. Though the reasons for which they do it are, of course, very various. They may do it because they want the territory, or because there's shortage of food, or because they want the women, or, latterly, uh, in competition for political power, building empires or whatever, um, uh, or, or just building a nation state. All these various motives have uh, led to a huge massacres and sometimes genocide. There's never been anything problematic about this because we would be just behave like that. We don't need psychedelics so we only have to recognize who are the social animals and that their reluctance to kill members of the species only applies to individuals, never to, to members of the, the other group. Or now I'm talking about things may be changing now, though in some parts of the world they are not. And um, I'm talking about how it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now David Aston didn't see it that way at all. He thought that there was some sort of uh, deep destructed, I don't know. He based himself partly on one or two of Freud's writings. Uh, he had read, but he had yeah. read that he group uh, analysis. Of group psychology uh, group and its relation to the ego. Which really, uh, I mean, if he knew the background of that book and what Gustav Le Bon was like, the man from whom Freud took yeah. the ideas, and that Freud never troubled, for instance, to contact the greatest of all sociologists who was on his doorstep, Max Weber, who, to whom we owe the concept of charisma, mm. so relevant on what he thought. But Freud, of course, wanted to be the great man, and so he took what to what ran, who was a perfect or much more than one, a political journalist. Uh, the work of Christophe Le Bon was produced uh, as a warning against the Bourgeoisist movement, and its its relevance was very political journalists from the 1890s. Freud didn't know that. And, uh, uh, and the only Freud that I've ever discovered David to have read was that. Mm. One of his poorest books. And Freud certainly, as soon as he gets out of the consulting room, is sometimes his best. But that is one of, <laughs> that's one of his worst. There we go. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Since we have about uh, 10 minutes at most, uh, we have time perhaps for, say, two uh, questions or comments. Yes. Uh, Please uh, introduce uh, yourself for everybody else. Yeah. I'm David Feldman. Um, in that last clip, yeah. I, um, it sounded as if um, a Norman Cohen sort of lurked. Uh, it was not a, just a, a disowning of of psychoanalysis and, uh, and really sort of a, a distancing, uh, and I think you're right, a distancing implicitly of his own work, but a lurch towards, uh, I mean, social Darwinism. I mean, it, it, it sounds like sociobiology. Um, and, and I just wondered if, if, if you thought that that was um, a, a real presence in his, in his thoughts or. Sort of, yeah, it'd be interesting to know Marina's view about whether Norman Norman's views at the end and how far you felt he he did want to really distance himself from the psychoanalytic approach and take go back to I something like the Neo Darwinian. To be right, all books and very much psychoanalysis. But he was saying probably because he didn't want to upset me. Psychoanalysis is wrong, but psychotherapy is all right. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. But in a sense, I was interested in where he seemed uh, to be moving yeah. towards. Yeah. It, it, it was, in a sense, to another sort of system. Yeah. Yes. Could, could we just I, uh, get yes, this I, comment or question before we go farther? Yes. I, I kind of wanted to put my 
my wording here because I had many discussions with him actually precisely along these lines because of my own interest in psychoanalysis. At the time that I met him, I was working as a journalist and not as a psychoanalyst. I'm now retraining as a psychoanalyst and psychotherapist. You should but, just say um, your name for the microphone. I'm, I'm Shan Abiyabarga. And um, I, I said to him that I was, you know, that I regretted that he had abandoned psychoanalysis as a way of understanding history. And he had... Um, and the, the impression that I had from him was that he abandoned it because he felt that he couldn't make it work. That he tried and he couldn't make it work and what he had written had been criticised and he'd recognised the validity of the criticisms and had therefore abandoned it. But I don't think he ever really stopped being interested in the possibility yeah. of using this as a tool. And to the end, I mean, one of, the, uh, one of my sort of great regrets is that I... I tried to, um, we never really got into it, but um, my background is, is uh, as a Lacanian, and um, I wanted him to meet my husband, Lionel, who, who te- who's a psychoanalyst and a Lacanian, and he teaches the subject. Um, and I did actually arrange a lunch at which um, Lionel came along to sort of talk about the, the paternal metaphor and certain other aspects of psychoanalysis, which I thought could be could be interesting, could inform a way of looking at um, at some of the things he talked about. And unfortunately, that meeting mm. never really came to fruition. Mm. But I think that to, to the end, he was interested. Yeah. It was that he continued to be interested in, he felt he tried it, he failed. He hadn't managed it, but perhaps it could be done. No, I, I reviewed, I looked at some of the reviews of uh, Black for Genocide, etc. Uh, before coming here, and it's very striking that Norman was badly beaten about the head by American sociologists who made absolutely impossible demands of what he was arguing, uh, almost saying, well, you know, if you can't falsify this, you can't do it. And it seems to me, I, I know from conversations with him as well in the 80s, that he felt that very deeply. And today, I feel it was entirely unreasonable uh, to criticize the work that he was doing from that perspective. First of all, the sociologists themselves can't do it about most things, so why blame Norman for that? Uh, Second of all, uh, he was really at a very early stage in exploring a very difficult area. And I think they preemptively cut him off at the pass, so to speak. Uh, And it was really a, a terrible shame. You're right. Okay. Uh, Daniel, do you want well, to I mean, respond? I, 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 I wish I'd had that second conversation because this first one was really scene-setting. It was about the context of the project and there was a further... sounds like you perhaps got f- further into this with him about methodology and, and really thinking and reflecting on it. But I think, in a way, the, the, the sort of distancing didn't do justice to what he had achieved in, in, in a way, assuring the American... That, that sort of psychobiographical... It wasn't about trying to get inside the head of individual dead people so much. It was about the role of fantasy in, in culture, in ideologies, and in, in taking that really seriously. I suppose it would be interesting to also know, you know, did he draw on the Annal tradition in France, I mean, given he's a professor of French, but the, the interest in, in mentality that comes through from Annal in the 30s onwards. Um, but, but, you know, or is it more specifically this idea of unconscious processes that I think he's trying to perhaps do something about collective processes but not in the Jungian sense of sort of archetypes there's something very particular he's doing that's hard to perhaps exactly crystallize what it is but when he sort of, I think he protests too much about the as, as you're saying in a way and loses track of in a way what was achieved and how inspiring it perhaps was then for some historians particularly coming through feminism but also people interested in witchcraft or, or both in the case of say Lindell Roper in thinking about, in having this dialogue between the sort of psych, psych, psychoanalysis and historicism. I think, I add, just for the last two minutes, one more point here that I think converges with what's been said. Uh, one has to know a little bit about Norman's style of work and writing. Uh, I, just by chance, happened to be present uh, in about 84 when while he was working on the manuscript that would later become one of his first books on uh, the end of the world, etc., I saw him take a huge manuscript 
that he had typed on his typewriter while he was with us and literally throw it into the waste paper can. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, he said, this, this is bad stuff. <laughs> uh, he said, I, I've got to start right back at the beginning and do it again and, and get it right. Uh, and he looked at me because he was also a bit of a mind reader. And he knew that I was thinking that I was going to grab that <laughs> and I got one of those conish cautionary glances that ended all ambitions in the and let it go out <laughs> with the waste paper <laughs> so it's quite possible you know had he been younger etc he might have come back to it uh, with the inspirations you're talking about you realized it was a sort of work in progress it wasn't the yeah. Well, thank you all very much. I think it's time for lunch. Thank you.